The History with Jackson podcast. Hello and welcome back to the History with Jackson podcast. Before we jump into today's episode, I'd like to once again ask you to consider supporting me here at History with Jackson by supporting me through the Buy Me A Coffee profile in the description below or through History with Jackson Plus on Apple Podcasts. Now that that bit is out of the way, today's episode I am talking to Emma Southern all about her brand new book with One World called A History of the Roman Empire in 21 Women. This was an awesome conversation with Emma. I really, really enjoyed talking to Emma. And I know you're really going to enjoy learning about the Roman Empire through a different paradigm. So without further ado, here is Emma discussing her new book. So hello and welcome back to the History of Jackson podcast. Today we are talking to author, historian and podcaster, Emma Southern about her new book, and it is an amazing book, A History of the Roman Empire in 21 Women. How are you doing, Emma? I'm good tonight. How are you doing? No, I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm really excited to have you on the podcast and to talk about your brand new book, which is an amazing book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. That's all right. Now, I wanted to ask you the first question I ask every historian who comes on the podcast. What was your inspiration for this book? Um. M- my inspiration for this book was that um, mostly in my kind of other life, when I'm not writing, I work part time in a bookshop. Um, and there has been a massive trend over the past couple of years for books about um, Greek myths and Greek women. Um, and lots and lots of, you know, Phaedra and and Circe and all of that kind of thing. Um, and everybody's into Greek myths and that's fine. But I was like, people should know more about Roman women. <laughs> A lot of the Greeks are getting a lot of attention and in ancient history there's always a slight tension between people who love the Romans and people who love the Greeks um, and as a, a huge defender of the Romans I wanted the Romans to get some attention as well so um, the kickstart was um, basically a, a desire to to show that the Romans are as good as the Greeks when it comes to women. <laughs> I love I love that you're just trying to equal that playing field. I think that's yeah. a strong that's a strong determinator. <laughs> yeah, there's a, it's harder because there's not that many uh, mythical women, so you get less of the um, kind of magic and and gods and things. But that means there's way more real women, which the Greeks had far fewer of, uh, yeah. and so you get kind of cooler stories because far fewer of them involve them being horribly victimized by other gods. <laughs> No, I do I do certainly agree with that you've got some very, very cool stories in this in this book. And obviously, as much as I'd like to like cover every single one of these twenty one women, we haven't got the time to to cover all twenty one. So I've I picked a few of them. But firstly, what made you want to choose these specific twenty one women? Um, I wanted women I wanted women from every period of Roman history so I wanted to start at the very beginning and go through um, to a fairly arbitrary point that I chose as the ending but to like to the end of the the fall of Rome um, is what I chose as the uh, as the end point but I wanted something from every period of 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 Roman imperial history and I wanted stories that were not empresses um, all the time because I think there is a very strong tendency when you're writing women's history to then write the story of queens, the story of leaders, the story of empresses um, and then you're kind of just telling political and military history again but with women instead of men. Um, so I really wanted to move away from that paradigm of history um, and I wanted women from around the empire so I wanted this idea that it the empire grows and then kind of shrinks again and um, contracts again. So you, we go through in Rome and then we move around the empire a little bit and then we come back to Rome again towards the end. Um, and so those are kind of my guiding principles. Sometimes when I was reading the sources, there were so many women to choose from that it was genuinely hard. So the late Republic and um, that period of Cicero and Caesar and Pompey, there's so many women about that I could have written the whole book just on the late republic the middle republic finding a woman is a nightmare <laughs> um like just searching for a woman who has more than one sentence written about her was a real challenge um but I was really determined to have somebody that represents every 
period and who gives a diversity of opinion so you don't just get or of experience so it's not the same story over and over again um partly because that would be really boring to read and partly because i want the the diversity of experience in the empire to be clear i, re- I really like how you shift in that paradigm in the book i think it gives a a more rounded picture of the roman empire as well of not just being this like you said a military power or a, a political circle where everyone's killing and backstabbing each other and so on <laughs> so yeah and i think that it's so easy to to slip into that story by accident um and to be like okay i need women so i've got you know and i've I've you know I've written a book about agrippine the younger then you could do livia you can do you know there's empresses all the way down once you get into that period and you can always do the wife of somebody but um i didn't the political history of Rome is already out there. The military history of Rome is already out there. I can give you kind of several books that will cover that. Like Tom Holland does a great job of telling of telling that those stories, for example, of like how um in you know Rubicon. If you want to know how the Republic fell, Rubicon is the best book ever. But if you want to know what like two women were doing during that period and how it impacted them very very differently, then um and how they experienced it as a change of culture, but also a terrifying period that um endangered them and their family in multiple ways while they were also dealing with infertility then um then I will tell that story instead and I I really enjoyed reading those those stories across this book but the first person I want to start with who I thought was a really interesting character is is Tana Quill now I've I've made sure that we've we've worked over pronunciations I will I will caveat that so what was her background and how did this impact her so she um, begins life in a uh, an Etruscan town. She's not really uh, she's not a Roman originally. Um, she um, is is born outside of Rome, and for she's from a very elite family within her town. Um, and she marries a man who has a Greek father. Um, which in Etruscan towns of that period meant that he could never be of truly elite status. Um, so he would, he could be nouveau riche, he could be as rich as anything, but he would never be one of the leading men of the city. Um, and so they decide between them that in order to kind of fulfil their ambition to be not just rich, but also politically powerful and influential and important in a way that they could not be um, within their own kind of city hierarchy, they decide to go to Rome, which at the time is still only about 200 years old. Um, It's a little baby city. It's still, um, and it's still a city where a, a hierarchy has not yet ossified, where it is possible for young people to come. um, And if they've got enough money and enough, balls basically to hustle then they can um they can become part of the aristocracy they can become part of the the leadership of rome um and so that is what they do they uh she persuades her husband to go off on this epic trip to leave their city and their family behind and and go to rome like little kind of young kids going off to the big city (laughs) it's 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 a really interesting journey how they've managed to get there but they also, or Tanakor believes that she and her husband receive a, a message. Uh, and I think this was quite an interesting part of her story. So what was this message and how did it kind of, kind of come to come into being? So as they are arriving in Rome, the story goes, and they're just kind of coming up to it. Um, they're traveling in their wagon and an eagle flies down from the sky um and takes her husband's called Lucolo at this point um he takes his hat off of his head which is like a little felt hat that he's wearing goes around in a circle and then comes back down and gently pops the hat back on his head um which is impressive enough by itself but it's very impressive because it's a covered wagon so it's come inside the wagon (laughs) and done this um and Tanaquil because she is um Etruscan the Romans believed that the Etruscans were um, profoundly connected to prophecy and had some an innate ability to read messages from the gods. She interprets this not just as like a super weird thing that happened to them on their trip or a eagle that got buyer's remorse, but um, instead she interprets it as a message from the gods. And she said it came from this part of the sky. So don't get she doesn't tell us which god it comes from, but it came from this part of the sky. He lifted it, you know, he touched your head and he put it back, and that means that we are guaranteed success um, when we get to Rome. It's a it's a really nice kind of way of her trying to 
see what's well, see what she wants to have happen really yeah. in, in Rome. Uh, it's a nice moment yeah. to imagine them like as two kind of young people, like before they've got children, they're just married, they're going, they've left everything behind, they're going into a place where they know nobody, um, where all they've got is like their wits and some cash, um, to kind of imagine them being like, that is proof that everything is going to be okay. <laughs> Uh, like it, that proves that we're going to be all right and like give them that little boost of confidence before they go into the city itself and, it, and it's a great it's a great story to go and tell people as well that this bird's yeah. flown into your wagon <laughs> and it's the exact kind of thing that people, romans would believe as well like well wait till you hear what happened and then everybody would be like oh well i heard that tanaquil and luclo were destined like they've been blessed by the gods so if we go to dinner at their house then we might get some of that blessing and it's like such a nice in for <laughs> So I want to ask, what kind of effect did Tanaquil have on Rome's culture, society and future then? So um, not only does she is she partially involved in getting her husband to be the king of Rome, um, which is pretty impressive, but she is remembered in Roman history as being, um, uh, she's remembered as being kind of a prototypical wife. Um, and when you get to the Republican period, when they're writing about her, because all of this writing about her is written under Augustus so it's not um contemporary in any way <laughs> but it is um it is very Augustan in its outlook uh, but um when they are writing about her they say you know we, in these ancient temples that we have that are, uh, are on the Esquiline um and on the Quiriline they have statues of her but they also have her spindle because she is remembered as being a weaver um and they also remember her as being the inventor of the pleated tunic and the pleated toga um which uh, were worn by uh, women on their wedding night and um young initiates so though she is remembered as a um as a person who is kind of who is very strongly engaged in in inventing and starting traditions that become profoundly roman um and also for being a kingmaker uh, more than anything she is the this this person who comes from nowhere and she is her and her husband do a little ruse um to make sure that he becomes the next king because at the time romans elected their kings and um, they have this kind of unusual system where um there's sent the patricians who are like the advisors to the king can uh, propose anybody to be the next king when the king dies and then they have a vote and he's elected um but the idea of hereditary um of like the son of the king might have a bit of an edge is starting to creep into that idea so Tanaquil and her husband trick uh, the sons of the previous king Marcius into going on a hunting trip on the day of the election so that they can't be elected <laughs> Um, which is great. Um, it leads to some disaster later on because those kids later grow up and, and kill her husband, at which point she manages to cover up the death um, for long enough to make sure that her kind of foster son, Servius, um, will become king in his place. And so she then uh, becomes a kingmaker twice over by... Um, she gives a speech in front of all these crowds and says, like, the king is fine, everything's all right. If everyone could just listen to Servius while we sort this mess out and he's recovering, and then kind of smooths over the transition to the election of him, of Servius becoming the next king. So she has this, this power, um, this influence behind the scenes that is the first time that we see that happening. I think, I think with that kind of movement, you know, not only to be so politically uh, influential in the time, but to be so culturally uh, significant yeah. is is amazing and i think the earl of warwick could probably move away uh, <laughs> yeah exactly because a... you know he was making kings but he wasn't inventing togas at the same time yeah. <laughs> so another another woman that i found incredibly interesting in this book is his hispala fakina yeah. um uh, could you tell us some more about who she is because i thought she was a fascinating character yeah so she is this kind of um Mid Republican figure who um, is a, she is a um, starts life as an enslaved person. She is enslaved and she is sold as um, a sex worker by the woman that owned her. Um, and she is then at some point freed 
uh, and is a freed woman who is still working as a sex worker um, in the centre of Rome. And she is called by Livy um, a famous sex worker. So she kind of has a reputation as a good one, I suppose, or <laughs> in demand, um, or very expensive or great. Um, this is about 186 BCE, so kind of the end of the Middle Republic. Um, and she um, has a boyfriend whose name is Abutius, who is a free man who lives next door to her. Um, and they're very much in love, which I think is very sweet. Um, and she, because she loves him so much, she accidentally exposes what is considered to be an Italy-wide conspiracy regarding bacchanals and orgies and secret people being murdered in fields. Um, and has the entire thing made illegal and... Um, initiates a huge crackdown of Roman power throughout Italy so that they can stamp out this terrible Bacchic religion that is like kind of spreading all over Italy and undermining the state, allegedly. Um, and the story goes that uh, it's quite a convoluted story, but the convoluted bit makes it fun. Uh, the story goes that Abutius comes to her and he says, I can't see you for the next couple of weeks because um, I have to be celibate for 10 days. And um, my mum says I have to be initiated into the Bacchic rites. Um, because I was ill and my mum said that she prayed to Bacchus to make me better and I've got better so now I have to do this to keep my mum happy and uh, Hespelia just loses her mind like flips out completely like throwing tables she barricades him into the room um some highly problematic behavior but she's like you cannot do this this is the worst thing the only person that would ever do this to you means you harm like this is a terrible thing i have been there um and she says that she was initiated into the back of Greeks when she was enslaved um and she knows what happens there and it's all singing and dancing and sex and boys being corrupted and people being killed in forests and she has all of these descriptions of, of people in frenzies and all that kind of if you've read donata or know anything about you know it's all back orgies it's pe men having sex with men and women also having sex with men and um particularly young men being killed but then also something about um people making secret plans and it to uh, poison one another um so Abutius goes home and says, oh, my girlfriend says that this is a bad idea. You wouldn't mean me any harm, would you, mum? And it turns out that his mum and his stepdad have spent all of his inheritance from his deceased father. Um, and they are having him initiated into the Bacchic Rites in the hope that he'll die. Um, and that they will never have to reveal that they, <laughs> uh, that they have spent all of his money. Um, so he runs away and um, runs to his his paternal family who get the consul involved who then have a whole um investigation and they get Hespalia out and force her to tell them what's been going on and they promise to protect her um and they then kind of clamp down on the um on these secret meetings that are happening at night where orgies are allegedly happening um and one of the pleasing things about this is that we don't just have literary sources about it because we have the um, decrees that were um, written and disseminated around Italy at the time that banned the whole um, the whole religion that said you weren't allowed to meet in groups, you weren't allowed to meet at night. Um, and so we know that this definitely happened, um, that there was this huge crisis about the Bacchanalic conspiracies and people. Um, and she was uh, given freedom to marry whoever she wanted she was given money as a reward for her bravery and coming forward um she was allowed to own property in her own name um which is a real insight into what you were not allowed to do if you were a freed woman in in mid-century rome but um yeah so basically because of her her concern for her boyfriend um, because she uh, did not want him to undergo the experience that she had undergone. She causes um, an entire uh, Italy-wide um, Italy -wide scandal, basically, one of the biggest scandals in Roman history and also allowed the Romans to really consolidate power in all around Italy, all over. Um, they could send the military in and say, we, are, we want them these bacchanals to stop but everyone would go the what now and they'd say yeah no <laughs> but the military's here to stay 
it's it's really quite it's it's really quite courageous and, and inspiring that she was able to you know take her own trauma and expose and try and prevent trauma for other people particularly her boyfriend um, yeah, yeah she, she doesn't in classic Roman style she's not massively interested in um, anybody else and like when they bring her in in the stories they um, the consul pulls her into a room with his mother-in-law and you know this is it's like being pulled into a room with but President Biden or something like somebody hugely powerful just suddenly turns up at your doorstep and drags you in and is like, tell me everything you know. Um, and her initial thing is, I don't know anything. I'm not going to tell you anything. This is, I just didn't want my boyfriend to get mad. <laughs> um, and she really tries to stonewall him um, until he basically promises that he will protect her um, and that she will, um, she will not face any consequences for having been in the, Bacchanals and that these priests who are allegedly going around murdering people left, right, and centre um, will will not be able to to harm her in any way. But she she does try not to cause a massive scandal. <laughs> but alas, you know, one, alas, one <laughs> she is dragged into it. But as a result, we know her name. We know this, and we you know we freed sex workers who lived and worked in Rome and, and not people whose names we know very often. Um, we know the names of the ones who wrote their names in graffiti in Pompeii and that's, you know, largely it. And so she, um, to know about her and to know of her existence in, is potentially worth it. And it was, it, it's a very, very inspiring and cool story. Uh, like like most of your, not most, all of your other stories. <laughs> Now, I want to move from this religion to another religion. And I'm I'm, I'm going to caveat this now. I'm probably going to mess the name up because I did earlier. <laughs> uh, but as the Roman Republic develops into the Roman Empire and its culture begins to develop and change, one of these changes is, is the growing influence of, of Christianity, one that is still around today, unlike the other religion. So did... Papu- oh, I messed that up. Never mind. I'm going to leave that in there anyway. Uh, Perpetua encounter. Yeah. How did Perpetua encounter this new religion? So Perpetua is a um, she's a young woman at the beginning of the third century, um, uh, and she lives in Carthage uh, in North Africa, um, and she somehow falls in with a group of Christians um, just after she has had her first baby um, and seemingly been widowed. Um, and she falls for it so incredibly hard that uh, she decides to give up her entire life and be martyred, basically. This is at the point when... This is a point when Christianity is illegal but not to the point where people are doing big persecutions necessarily. There's been one big one uh, under Marcus Aurelius, but we've not reached that kind of height of persecutions. But when Christians show up in front of um, in front of imperial governors around the empire, they kind of have to do something about it. And they're very, very reluctant to do something about it. A lot of the time they are, um, when you read accounts, because Christians publish accounts, um, they're, very much do not want to be killing Christians necessarily, especially not young women who are still breastfeeding, but um, they get denounced and then they come in front of the governors and the governors have to do something about her. And the reason that um, Perpetua really stands out above all the other women who did this is that she wrote a diary of her experience. So she started writing while she was um, imprisoned. So they put her in, in the prison while uh, for she wrote about her trial. She writes about the conversations that she has with her family um, and the uh, feelings and experiences that she has while she is in prison um, about how much she misses her child, how she prays for a miracle so that um, her her breast will stop hurting, basically, from the fact that she's still producing milk but can't feed her child. Um, so also prays so that she can believe that her child will survive without her milk um so she can stop grieving for him um she worries about her family she worries about what she's doing to her father um but and she also worries about what she's going to experience because she is sentenced to go into the arena um and to fight the beasts and to be executed as part of the of an imperial birthday games um and she writes right up until the point uh, of the night before that she is going 
to go into the arena and then somebody else a man um finished the story for us um and because she she believed that she experienced miracles um in her captivity and because she was a very young woman who was executed alongside another very young woman who also experienced a miracle um it's called Felicitas. Um, they became kind of patron saints of um, of Carthage, and were on the day of their martyrdom. They were their story was read over and over again, and so we have lots of copies of what she wrote um, and what people wrote about her of the dreams that she had, how she believed she was experiencing miracles, and then what happened to her because she was sent into the arena naked against a cow. Um, and the uh, the crowd were upset by this. They were hugely upset by seeing two very young, very obviously um, kind of very recently postpartum uh, naked women. And so they had to be covered up and then they were sent out in front of the cow again. Um, and then they were... Um, having been kind of trampled a little bit that all of the Christians, she's a group of five of them are executed on stage, which is actually quite rare. Um, in, in Roman executions, generally the, you get kind of mauled a bit. Um, and then they just take you off and cut your throat and chuck you in a pit. Um, because <laughs> we're not a sentimental people. <laughs> um, but she is executed, um, on, uh, in front of everybody. Um, and she, displays such bravery such conviction in what she's doing even when she is afraid that the the strength of this young woman um in the face of 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 the the horror that she experiences is profoundly inspirational to other christians because then they can say if this young girl this 20 year old can give up her child can give up her life can be this inspired by god then why can't you um, and so it becomes a story that is spread around and is is hugely um, inspirational to other Christians, both during the time of the martyrdom and then afterwards. They can say, look how great our Christians are, that they can be this strong. It, From a non-Christian perspective, it looks like crazy behavior. Um, and it, when you read these things, you're like, if it's like somebody clearly you can see why people were worried because it's exactly the same kind of thing you'd read it's like your friend was going off to join jonestown or something like when they're just like no i'm a christian now and i'm giving up everything and i'm going away and i'm literally going to die in the most humiliating way, way possible and her father is like please don't do this like I'm begging you, don't do this. Jesus is like, no, this is what I need to do. This guy over here has told me that Jesus is great and I'm going to go. And you, it is, if somebody came to you, you know, in your life and said, I'm going to go and have myself executed, you you would, you know, try and get some men with white coats to like rescue them. <laughs> but they're told as these hugely inspirational stories because Christianity, uh, you know, eventually won. So they can be told as she was doing the right thing in the name of in the name of her religion. I, d- I definitely think that narrative, perhaps from from Christianity, is maybe missing in its history. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, it's they're actually always very well. Like when you read the early Christian text because so many of them are about young women running off from their families and their parents like right up until even when you start to get monasticism um you get women trying to run off to be monastic women you know and to join nunneries or to go and lock themselves in a cave somewhere and even men and while their parents are like lying on the floor in front of them going don't do this um don't give up your entire life can't you just be a normal christian and they're like no i'm gonna go and be one of the in insane <laughs> like I'm dedicated to this and this is everything um and so they're quite um surprisingly honest very often about the intense reactions that they inspire in that they and they tend to see their family as being obstacles that they have to overcome but you can clearly see like that this is just a family that is like my child is going away from me forever and is possibly going to die and is going to definitely going to suffer. And I really don't want that to happen to them. It's it's interesting to see that play out in the story as you write it, but also play out in her, her showing her concerns through that diary. I think yeah. that's really quite interesting. Um, and it's yeah. not a perspective we have a lot in history. No, because um, so many of the, the 
particularly martyrologies, but so many like religious stories are told from the perspective of people who are writing about the martyrs. And so they tend to want them to be superheroes. Like they didn't have feelings. They just, they just had a pure love of God and they ran off. But when Perpetua writes about herself, she is saying, this really hurts. And I, it hurts me to see my father crying and it hurts me to give up my son and it hurts me to be experienced with this and this prison sucks um, and I hate it and I'm afraid of going into the arena um, and I need some guidance um, and it's it's so much more human and so much more, I mean, it's not relatable at all, but it's so, you know, it's so much more textured and believable and and real than somebody saying she was never afraid and she just, she, she threw her baby across the room and kicked her father in the face and stormed into the area. I think that's what I like about all these stories. They're all very human. They're all very textured. Um <laughs> But now I have a final fun question for you, Emma, as we do for everyone on the podcast. Now, you co-host, and it is an amazing podcast, the History is Sexy podcast, uh, with your with your host, uh, co-host, Janina Matthewson. So on your podcast, and I've, I've listened to so many episodes, they're all, they're all awesome. You've covered so many great topics on there. So which, now I know I've used this term <laughs> before, it's like asking a mother to pick her favorite child, but which is your favorite episode and why? Ooh. That's a good question. Uh, I I really like our Rasputin episodes, um, and not just because I read Rasputin's daughter's biography of her father for it, which is one of the wildest things I've ever read in my entire life and has full chapters about his penis. Uh, (laughs) uh, But also the third episode of that contains, um, we went line by line through Boney M's Ra Ra Rasputin um, to consider its historical accuracy. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so I I like that. I think Rasputin is such an interesting figure because he's so... um, mythologized as like this big bad evil but when you kind of start digging about you realize and not only is he very normal and just a bit smelly but like a lot of the stories that you think you know about him are entirely not just imaginary but are at their core kind of farcical so the whole story about him being poisoned and then shot and then drowned when all three of the assassins wrote biographies about it and all three of them claim that they uh, swapped out the poison for something else because they chickened out but didn't want their other conspirators to know. So they kind of get this image of all of them, um, like all of them swapping out harmless powders for other harmless powders <laughs> um, and everybody thinking that the other one is swapping out arsenic um, and then like the whole situation with he's running away that everybody thinks everybody like the whole story and so many of the stories about Rasputin are kind of like silly at their core um, and but yeah, he has this this idea of him as this this mythical, monstrous, magical man. So yeah, Rasputin episodes. Oh, I think that's a very good choice. I think that's a very good choice. And he's very, very interesting. I was a very interesting man. <laughs> but the reason why we're here today is is we've we've spoken about your book. And of course, our listeners are going to want to go and grab a copy of your book and find you and your work online, Emma. So when is your book out? And then where can they grab a copy of your book? Uh, so the book out out on officially on 7th of September, 2023. Um, and you can get it at all good bookshops. Um, I think if you go to independent bookshops, they would get signed copies. But um, you can get them. You should be able to get one at any decent bookshop. Um, you can find me at emmasouthern.com. Um, and if you are not blocked by a work profanity filter then you can find historyofsexy.com as well and i am there and i i do really encourage everyone to when your book comes out to go and grab a copy because it is really great and it's a great change in the narrative of the roman empire i was going to say roman republic then they're all the same but yeah <laughs> them too <laughs> well thank you very much for coming on emma i really appreciate it thank you so much for having me that's right thank you So I hope you enjoyed this episode with Emma Southern. I hope you agree that she was absolutely awesome and this was such a great topic to get into. And there's so many more women in Emma's book that we could learn about and I really hope you go and grab her book to learn more about them. Now, in the meantime, if you enjoy the content that we're putting out here at History of Jackson, including this episode, please do consider heading to the Buy Me A Coffee profile link in the description below or to History of Jackson Plus on Apple Podcasts. Next week, we've got an amazing episode lined up. I know you're going to enjoy it. So I'll see you then.